Greetings and salutations, everybody. It's Dave DuFord here at DuFord Insurance Group, where I train and recruit agents nationally to sell things like final expense and Medicare, both face-to-face -face and over the phone. And today I have Mike Hedge from the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors on to talk about a very timely and important topic that affects all independent insurance agents. If you are an agent or aspiring to be an agent, this is something you really need to listen to because there's been some recent legislation passed in the House as of approximately March 9th or March 10th, uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, I brought Mike on here to talk more about it. So Mike, uh, welcome and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then what this whole uh, legislation is about and what the uh, issues may be with it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on today. So my name is Michael Hedge, as mentioned. Uh, I'm the Director of Government Relations for NAFA. Uh, I work with primarily the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee, but I also work on other issues that are related to my overall portfolio. Um, this bill that I'm going to talk about today is, was originally out of the Education uh, and Labor Committee. Uh, but it, it, it's, it deals heavily with unionization called the PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. And that's not something that necessarily, you know, comes up in the NAFA radar right away. And as far as a lot of people are framing this as a union bill, this is something that benefits the unions. NAFA doesn't generally have to play in that field. Uh, but I can tell you, I, I spent, um, I worked for two members of Congress on the Hill uh, quite a while ago. And at this point, uh, Congressman John Kasich and David Hobson, both from Ohio, and I've been a lobbyist for the last, uh, I don't know, 15 years or so. And this is the kind of bill that might be a sleeper at first on introduction, but it definitely can have ramifications across the industry. So basically, this bill was based on a piece of California legislation called Assembly Bill 5. And it was introduced a few years ago at this point now. And that Assembly Bill really set out to broaden the ability of unions to allow uh, employees to unionize. They wanted more people to have access to unionization possibilities. And so again, not necessarily our wheelhouse, but in that provision, uh, they established an ABC test. And the ABC test set out three separate um, uh, points or steps, however you want to define them. And if you don't meet those points, you are not considered an employee. But if you meet any one of those points, you are by law considered an employee and would be a W-2 filer. You would be, you'd lose, if you had a 1099 status, you'd lose that. This was really aimed at companies such as Lyft or Uber or DoorDash or any of those other, you know, contractor services where legislators in California thought that the people that were working for those companies weren't, weren't receiving the kind of employee package you'd want them to. So we worked with legislators out in California and we said, look, the insurance industry, the 1099 status, the independent contractor status is so vital to the industry. If you were to remove that from the insurance industry, you would revolutionize the industry for the wrong reasons and really complicate a lot of the relationship between carriers and the people that sell their policies. And after a lot of back and forth, we worked with two of our trade partners out in California. We were able to get an insurance carve out that that basically said, if you are regulated by state law uh, for the sale of insurance, securities, uh, what have you, um, you, you know, we're already so regulated to begin with that you don't need that additional coverage. And the insurance industry got the full carve out, full exemption. We actually ended up supporting the bill just because it was kind of a, a trade-off. We said we'd support it if they took us out of it, uh, which is always kind of a bad sign looking at, at it from the in, outside in, right? Uh, but it did work for us, and we were very happy with it. It was a big legislative victory for us. Now, the federal government picked this up in the last Congress. I've been working this issue for NAFA on the federal side since 2019, which is really early. If you look at the all the people involved in the lobbying process on the insurance side, for because we represent NAFA, the agents themselves, the insurance producers, not the companies per se, we work closely with the companies, but our interests lie with the actual producers. Yeah, I looked at it and I said, this could have some implications. If you look at part B of the bill that was introduced of the ABC test, that's the one area that I have a problem with. And basically it says that you're not, uh, you're not an employee if the service is performed outside of the usual course of business of the employer. 
Now, that's some great vague federal language that <laughs> even a lobbyist doesn't really appreciate. Um, but what it says is, basically to break it down, if you're doing a task for a company that doesn't affect their normal operations, um, such as if, for example, if Burger King hired you to pick up dry cleaning, you could argue you're an independent contractor, not an employee. However, if Burger King had you selling hamburgers on the side of the road at a stand, you'd be considered an employee. That is their business, selling hamburgers. Insurance carriers, mm. independent contractors to sell their policies. You cannot make the argument that if you're an insurance producer or if you're a financial advisor and you're offering the policies of a carrier, their business is insurance. You're selling their policies. That would completely take away the ability for you to have any kind of a 1099 status for filing purposes and create a, a new world where you're a W-2 employee. They have to provide full health support, health care, health insurance, all those other benefits, but you lose the ability to make decisions for yourself, run your own business. And I think that's what a lot of the legislators didn't understand initially in Washington was that for insurance producers, they're running, a lot of them are running their own, their own agencies, their own small business uh, conglomerate, if you will. And they, they love that. You know, we conducted a survey at NAFA of our membership. And the, the number two point on how would this affect you negatively if the PRO Act were to pass was that mm -hmm. I would lose my ability to decide how, how I want to spend my day. If you're working in the industry as a 1099 filer, my assumption is that's what you want to do. Uh, we have had 94% uh, of respondents to our survey specifically said they were not interested in union, unionization purposes. And so it's not that there's this big clamoring within the insurance producer industry saying we need to unionize. And that's not even been the focus of our bill. Everyone I've spoken to both within the insurance industry and up on the Hill they acknowledge this isn't about unionization. This is purely a test. That's the big talking point for us. Now, over the course of the last two years, almost every, everyone we've met with, and the bill passed on, on March 9th uh, in the evening. And uh, if you look at the vote, it was a close vote, obviously. The House is very evenly divided. But there were five Republicans that voted for the bill and one Democrat that voted against it. And I think... When, when people are looking at the benefits of the bill, it does create more worker rights, at least in their conceptualization. Uh, the problem with a lot of these kind of federal union bills is that it forces employees to do things they don't wanna do or forces uh, workers or independent contractors to do what they don't wanna do. And that's where we have the issue. But if talking to the people that voted for this, the co-sponsors of the legislation, when you talk to them and say, hey, listen, the insurance industry is a different animal. This is not Uber. I like Uber, and I think Americans like their Uber, but this isn't Uber. This is the way the system's worked. It's been successful, and there's not been any kind of clamoring for change to the system. And they look at you and say, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what, how we understand it. This is not directed at the insurance industry. So why can't we get a carve out? Well, you know, legislative process and all that. This time around, because the bill passed the last Congress, uh, I had worked the bill. I, I want to say I was one of the few lobbyists actively working this bill in the 116th Congress. The reason being that no one ever saw a chance for actual passage because the Senate was Republican. This time the bill was reintroduced and the Congress has this process where if you had a bill introduced, uh, say in the House, the prior Congress, um, you can reintroduce it without having to send it to committee for markup. And mm -hmm. That's easy if you're trying, that's, that's a better method if you're trying to pass legislation. It's a nightmare when you're a lobbyist trying to affect change to a leg, legislative piece. And so it did never went to markup in committee. There was no option at that point to offer amendments and it was sent straight to the floor. Now they did allow floor amendments and we actually worked with three different members of Congress, uh, two Democrats and a Republican. Um, the Republican would have been a reach, but you know, the Democrats really where you wanna get that amendment from. Um, they introduced the amendment the amendments were not adopted. Uh, I think there were 57 amendments that were, were introduced and they voted uh, in bonk for nine of them. So mm -hmm. it was never gonna happen. But the issue is they just didn't wanna see the, the legislative process held up. They wanted to activate this. And if you look at the progressives on this, especially in the house, 
Uh, they want this kind of a labor bill. They want this union bill. And any attempts to modify it is seen as trying to strip it of the power that it has. And, you know, that's from an ideological perspective. I understand that. I understand posturing. I understand politics and talking points. But when you look at the insurance industry as a whole, um, for us, 90% of our respondents were 1099 filers. You know, the majority of our membership, and, and NAFA represents all forms of, you know, uh, broker dealer reps and, and insurance producers. And the thing is, 90% of our, our respondents were 1099 filers. Uh, the majority of our base is independent contractors. And that's huge for us. It's huge for our business. It's huge, huge for their business. And it sounds really bizarre to think that you could wake up one day and you are no longer allowed to operate the business you've been operating for 30 years. It's, it's, it's political and federal overreach. And we see a lot of that in Washington. Uh, what I would say is that there is good pause for hope in the Senate. Uh, this would likely go to, uh, you said the Senate still has the filibuster. The Democrats ha leadership has not figured out how to remove it yet because they're, because of the amount of moderates in the Senate on the Democratic side. With the filibuster being likely in this case, you'd be looking at 67 votes for passage. Um, I think they'd be hard to get a simple majority for passage in the Senate. Um, you have people on the fence, like someone like a Joe Manchin, who is from a very pro-union West Virginia uh, as a moderate Democrat, but that's okay. I personally, my, my own personal views are this bill shouldn't pass at all. Um, but my job and my concern is the industry and, you know, insurance producers and financial advisors jobs. And if you get someone like a Joe Manchin who says, look, I like this bill, I cannot vote against a pro-union bill in West Virginia, no matter how conservative my Democratic majorities become, but I can appreciate that the insurance industry needs a carve out in the situation. It would upset the insurance industry to a point where you would not recognize the sale of insurance. And talking to our advisors and everyone that's been concerned about it, it really comes down to the ability to serve your clients and taking away your freedoms to operate, taking away your freedom to make decisions for how you run your business, that ultimately affects the consumer, the clients. And I don't know that there's anyone in Washington that doesn't understand that. It's just a matter of getting them to actually do something about it. Um, and unfortunately, again, the House process they went with this time around was really, really difficult um, because of they didn't, they didn't send the bill to committee. And so I think that in the Senate, I am hopeful. I do not see this bill passing unaltered. Um, I think this bill is going to have trouble passing at all. And so, but the one thing you never do in Washington is sleep on it because you, just because you think they can't get the votes, you, you've got to make sure the amendments included in that. So really, since the bill passed, I, I was set to go into action. NAFA was set to go into action um, before the vote was even tallied up. Um, and we started our Senate advocacy. We've been working with certain mem members of the Senate on the, uh, the, help uh, the help committee over there, which is going to be the committee of jurisdiction for the bill. And uh, we've been working with some of them already, and but we've done a we've started a full Senate campaign outreach now to try to get an amendment introduced, because that's the thing. There are two ways we win in this situation: the bill fails, uh, or we get a carve out, and it's really essential for that carve out because without it, everything changes. Yeah, it, it's it would be disastrous to the industry. And, you know, it's, it's just that one line of lang language that's really, there are a lot of issues with the bill when you look into it. it uh, for instance, it creates a, the, 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 the onus is on a supervisor to identify if his employee is a 1099 or W-2 filer. And so if you're a 1099 filer and you suddenly flip over to a W-2 filer because of this legislation, if the, your supervisor, whoever that may be in that's the situation, doesn't identify it, doesn't report you, the supervisor is fined by the government. And it completely ch changes the fair labor uh, you know, regulations. Uh, it, it, it's crazy to put that responsibility. It's not, a, it's not about you having to say, I guess that's one thing you could say as an insurance agent is you wouldn't have to say, I'm gonna report myself because it, you're not gonna get fined. Your supervisor at that carrier uh, or whatever situation you'd be in would actually take the penalty. And uh, it, it just, it's, it's bad legislation. But like a lot of bad legislation, you understand the intent. It's just not something that's practical. 
and uh, Americans love their Uber. You know, I mean, take away Uber and see what happens. Uh, the, the Uber and Lyft spent $10 million, I believe it was, uh, defeating this bill in California. The interesting thing was that in an AB5 in California, even though we had the carve out, um, I followed the bill extensively and that bill, it passed, was signed into law by the governor um, and then ended up going to a legal battle to see if it was actually legal and constitutional. And the California court ruled that it was, it upheld the law, but then Uber and Lyft spent, uh, I wanna say $10 million of their own money over the last election cycle to put this on the ballot and let the people of California decide. Now, the, the, there are two funny things about that. When you look at California legislation, you assume California is big. It's the largest economy in the US for states. A lot of federal legislation starts in California. They adopt measures in California. That's generally not a good thing from the business perspective. However, in this instance, the federal government took a California bill that passed and made it worse. <laughs> they make it better. They take out some of the more progressive policy aspects of it. Here they made it worse. Um, but on top of that, uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it was like 67% of Californians who, again, voted Democrat down, you know, down the page for state office, 67% of Californians nullified this law. Even Californians wanted Uber. You know, and, 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 and by saying that, they also wanted insurance producers to be able to operate in their state. And that's the thing. There's so many far reaching ramifications. But the, the American people don't want this. The American consumer doesn't want this. And for, from our perspective, I, I've, I've not talked to a single insurance producer or uh, financial advisor that has said, you know, this bill will give me the ability to really join that union I've always wanted to join. Um, <laughs> so that's really what it comes down to. So what, what can my audience do to, to influence things to, to keep the things the way they are? What would you suggest at this point? You know, <clears throat> contact your senator. Uh, send an email to your senator. If you have a relationship with your senator or Senate staff, reach out to them and say, hey, look, there's this bill coming up. It came out of the House, H.R. 842. And the thing is, we get why it's been introduced. We get why it's been passed. But the insurance industry is unique. It is a unique operational model. It is not the, the intent of the language in this le legislation is not intended to destroy the insurance industry, but that's what it would do. And tell a story, uh, tell a story of how it would affect your business. Um, for a lot of, uh, I think the, the most popular uh, answer that we received on how this would affect you and why you wouldn't wanna do this uh, was the loss of deductions. You know, it's, it's kind of like servers are arguing that a $15 minimum wage is going to take money out of their pockets, not add money to their pockets. You know, those are obviously servers in good situations, but uh, to tell them how the bill negatively impacts you. Um, people on the Hill know me. Uh, some people like me, some people don't. Uh, as a constituent, they have to like you. You know, they have to at least pretend to like you and they will listen. Um, most of the people we deal with, they do listen, even if they don't necessarily share our views and ideas. And this is that kind of legislative policy um, where it's not about ideology, it's about understanding. And no one in Congress, almost no one in Congress wants to destroy the insurance industry, right? Um, so if you get that point across, send an email, give a call to the office, just ask them, you know, let's get an insurance carve out. That's what we want, an insurance carve out to really protect the industry and continue the ability to serve the American public. Mike, I appreciate you being on here and explaining this legislation to my audience and you guys know what to do now. Mike, so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. You got it.